context, it was the case that no matter how much his upcoming opponents sparred with their sparring partners, right. their sparring partners couldn't recreate what they were inevitably exactly. going to face when they went in with him. <laughs> yeah. 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 A sparring partner is not Leon Spinks or whoever he was facing. <laughs> it's like, wait a second. He's much faster and it's much harder. <laughs> That's a whole oh, no, different he meant, thing. He meant him. In other words, his, his opponents had their sparring partners, but they weren't prepared for oh, yeah. what it was yeah. like to get hit by Mike Tyson. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I can, yeah. All of those things. <sighs> and I don't know if anyone's a boxing fan. I, I probably was more at the time, but I remember those, you know, and that's when boxing was still, you know, these big, big events. And there were these giant promoted pay-per-views and arena full of people that you know planned their whole evening around the event and people planned and purchased these expensive pay-per-views and they sit down and <laughs> fight last under 10 seconds <laughs> the event's over well. Cool questions today. That'll be fun. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Office Hours. If you're watching on YouTube, you can find out more about what we do at officehours.global. Our first hour is general discussion about media and virtual production. Our second hour is usually something we want to spend a little bit more time on. And today we're going to be talking about the universal truths of preparing for a mix 
or any kind of live event for PA recording and broadcast and streaming. So it should be interesting the second hour. Um, let's go ahead and jump into the questions. Bill, what do we have? First one comes from Jeff Cohen in Miami Beach, Florida. Descript announced their acquisition of Squadcast to offer remote recording of podcast guests. Any experience with Squadcast's stability, reliability, and quality? Yeah, I've actually had some um, experience with it um, as a uh, um, as a um, a co co host or whatever, uh, or, or a panelist in a in a Squadcast. It worked really well. Yeah, go ahead, Jeff. Yeah, so I, and I think this is interesting. I've been experimenting with doing uh, even multi-track dialogue editing for shows uh, with Descript, um, primarily things that have not been recorded in Descript, so there's some extra steps there. So anything that can make that process doable, especially reliable, is interesting. Uh, at first, it will be separate, but eventually, they do plan to integrate this into uh, directly into the Descript client. Although, if I'm not mistaken, um, the guests are exclusively coming in through Chrome. So, I mean, that by itself introduces some degree of uh, stability questions and problems for some people. So, that's good to hear, though. That so far. Uh, your experience has been positive. Yeah, no, I, I've only been on a couple times. I've been asked to come on and you go onto a web page and you you start the thing up and you're talking to someone and, and it's recording locally and then it transmits that back to them. It's a really good idea. And, you know, one of the hard parts uh, that you have with the script in general is how do you deliver those files back? So being able to get those files, the, the big thing that I think that's going to happen with Squadcast is being able to get those files in the right um uh, you know, in the right order, sectioned. We know what the names are of the people that are in it. We know all kinds of things. So, so Squadcast is going to be able to deliver metadata back to Descript. That's going to make it a lot more accurate. So, well, so I think it's going to be really interesting. Yeah, and, and they have already actually integrated it from the Descript side. So again, the for right. the guests, the Streamlabs component is separate. If you already have a Streamlabs account, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, a squadcast, squadcast account, mm -hmm. account you can merge the accounts today but if you uh update and refresh your descript client you will already see when you go to do a new project you'll see a new option there for um new remote recording and um, what is interesting by the way at least for now a part of the announcement was that all of that recording time does not count against your transcription minutes it will be transcribed but it does not count against your transcription minutes. So that's really cool um, to be yeah, seen, but, but it'll come in automatically into your Descript project. Uh, the only thing you would have to do is once, of course, identify the speakers and right. then it'll automatically apply that everywhere. Yeah, so I think that, I think it's a, it's a really smart um, acquisition. I think that it'll help Descript a lot. Now, Squad, now, I've only used Squadcast for audio. Does it support video as well? It does. This is both audio and video today. That's great. Yep. That's great. Yeah. Cause I, I've only used, I think I used it before they, they added video or the per people that I've used only used audio for what they were and, doing. And to be clear, if I understand it correctly, they are doing both streaming it out mm -hmm. to the Squadcast servers as well as recording live so that right. so it's if a little the live like Riverside. Yeah, right. Exactly. Like, like all of them so that you can recover a cloud version if there's a problem with the local, but of course, right. You rely ultimately on getting that better quality uh, local recording. The only concern I always have with that is that if it's doing it at the same time and someone has limited bandwidth, is that affecting the the overall performance of everything? I mean, a lot of people don't have barely enough bandwidth to do a Zoom call, <laughs> let alone upload things. So, so it'll be interesting to see how that goes. Uh, next question. Next is also from Jeff Cohen, and this time he asks, suggestions to plan against this live event's teachable moment. And I guess this was the, the Descript uh, session yesterday. First, there was the host, then the pre-recorded video, then reality deviates from the plan at about 531 in the stream. Then somebody restarts the video from the beginning, then the host left on her own, and he's got a link there to a YouTube piece of that. And we also have something in our notes, too. Okay, go ahead, Courtney. I didn't have a chance to actually look at the whole thing. It's more than an hour long. Uh, but uh, I did look at the part where uh, things go awry. It looks like they lost, they were in the middle of playing back a video and it went away, it went to black. 
So it could be they lost power on their video playback system or something crashed. Uh, but uh, then the host is left to tap dance alone in front of the live audience uh, with nothing really prepared. And then apparently they restarted the video uh, back from the beginning. It's a fairly long video. So and then the host left, apparently. So, <clears throat> you know, to prepare for this, you, you probably want to have a we stand by slide a separate video player queued up with the same video uh, queued up to it. It may not have to stay in sync, but at least uh, if it crashes, somebody who's in charge of playing back could position the playback head somewhere near where it, it left off and switch to it. Uh, this is a, a good uh, teaching moment to learn that you always should have a backup playback system <laughs> and a UPS on all of your stuff in case there's a power supply failure. Um, yeah, and something, it would help to have somebody else online to, uh, talk with rather than just throw it to the host with nobody else to react with. So I think the, the poor host, a woman was, uh, uh, her person was, was talking to, yeah. you know, talking to the audience basically uh, who was on chat. But yeah, it was hard. Was uh, there's so many, so many things here. We'll get to them. Yeah. <laughs> Go ahead, Lucas. Yeah, I also uh, only had the chance to look at the part that went wrong. And what I found interesting is that it did seem to me that the host didn't really have um, a good communication structure to the um, to whoever was. Do you think uh, that anyone else was working on it? I think she was streaming it herself. I think that's oh, the issue. well, that yeah, then. <laughs> what, that's what it looked like. It looked like she was trying to figure it out. But um, might be. Yeah, go ahead, Jeff. No, I think that's what was clear is there was at least one other person involved because she was clearly caught off guard. I mean, of course, that there was a problem in the video stopped playing. What happened ultimately, someone else, again, restarted that video after like over a minute of kind of dead air and tap dancing and chat asked her if she knew any jokes and um so I guess lesson learned is, you know, if all else fails, you know, have something the, to talk about maybe the, uh, if if there is a back end. But what happened is she ultimately, so they restarted it. Uh, they restarted the video uh, that they were playing back at the beginning, even though they were a couple minutes in. So everyone in the chat, of course, was frustrated with that. Hey, great, you're back. But do we need to rewatch these first few minutes? And then it dropped out again. And that's when she was on her own. What happened is, which is how it's clear there was at least some other, some other person, is she ultimately, uh, you know, live had to go find that video herself. She then played it on her machine and then screen shared um, her playback of the video. So it was clearly not how it was running originally. And, and perhaps also a lesson learned there if you have a small team is be you know, be prepared, have that queued up. If you're planning to play a video, if the other person may drop out, have that queued up as a fail safe. Yeah. You know, not to pile onto someone, but I, uh, I, this is, you could tear this whole thing apart on so many levels of what not to do. Like this is, uh, this is not like one error. Uh, this was a cat, what we call a cascading failure. And so a cascading failure is that this gets, we talk a lot about the idea that you have, you know, if you have, if you think about your capacity to do something is to hear where we're trying to always build our kit is to live somewhere between, you know, like this is what we would consider, you know, a good level, 40% of what you have. This is a, you know, yellow level that's up to about 60%. And this, anything over 60% should be considered you're in danger. You're in danger of a cascading failure. And the issue with that is, is that the cascading failure means that when one thing goes wrong, everything's going to go wrong, you know, and it really felt looking at that video, I skipped through it. And I looked, of course, at the area that you gave us, that they were operating about here, you know, so they were way above, they had not, not nearly enough people to do what they were trying to do. They were way, they were over a hundred percent capacity, which means that People are not getting, they're not even getting to all the things that they need to get to because there's, they're, they're, they are so, um, you know, underutilized. And for, you know, this, this comes down to, you know, not respecting live, you know, and Descript is a large enough company 
they could have spent the right money. And when we talk to when we talk to clients and we say the most expensive, um, the most expensive part of any project is failure. Like failing is the thing you want to avoid. And it doesn't mean that you have to spend more, but it does mean you have to get more simple. Like this could have been just a video. Like they, you know, there was a little bit of interaction, you know, with the audience. Um, the, even when they brought in what I think was just an audience member, this is the Crowdcast platform, which um, I don't like. <laughs> I'll be honest, you know, so. Um, they went to the team a little further in. They went live to the they team. went to the team, but then they brought From Squadcast person. and then, yes, brought in They brought somebody uh, else attendees. in that was just a, an intent, like that is a, I have brought attendees in. I've done, you know, over 2000 online events. And I brought attendees in live on purpose, like four times, <laughs> you know, like, you know, like we just don't, and, and they brought an attendee in with his mic was back and sounded horrible. And, you know, you, you prep everybody that you're going to put on video, you know, you don't, you don't put, just put them on, you know, and, um, and, and so, uh, so anyway, there was, you know, there were those things, the, the whole way that Crowdcast works with all those windows moving around and everything else is just really chaotic. So you have one thing zoom up and then it zooms back down, then it zooms back up again. Um, they split the comments. So if you notice that they were taking comments from Crowdcast, but they weren't taking, they weren't really interacting with the YouTube. So why stream? Like why stream this if you're not going to interact with the, with the, the online audience? And so, um, so they, you know, you, I always try to have people, this is why, unless you're using a tool like what we built with Makana and the other version of this that a lot of you don't see very often, but we can integrate all of those things together. But if you don't do that, then you should just do it to one platform to keep all the comments going the same way, but you shouldn't multi, you know, break, you know, break up your platforms. Um, and so, so it, it just, there were, I mean, it, it's just like a master class and what not to do. Like it was, you know, for a company that's doing really good products. And, and the problem is, is they're trying to go into the market that they're, that they just dumped into. And you could tell that she was under a lot of stress. I mean, there's, I often say that, um, you know, that, you know, having a live event go sideways is like cutting off your arm with a butter knife. Like, it's just, you're there, you're in front of a lot of people. You can't figure out how to get out. You can't work it out. And you should never have the host have any technical needs. You know, like the, the host should not be connected to fixing the problem um, because they have to sit there and tap dance. So what she, you could tell when, her, when someone's tongue sticks out, I always assume they're doing something. That's when, that's when you do that. So, so there's like, when you see someone's tongue stick out, that's a problem. So anyway, and I, so think I think to, to Lucas's point, I, I think at least at one point it was clear that she was not getting, I don't know if she ever was, but at least towards the end where she decided to play the yeah. video, it was clear that she was just kind of making that call to do it. She because wasn't she's getting communication and, to do that. And to, and to your point, you know, the, you want to have, um, there are three slides that we build for every event starting soon. So if we're running late, there is, uh, we'll be right back. We do not put our logo on it and we do not say technical difficulties. Those become memes. So don't, don't do that. Just say, we'll be right back or, you know, come, you know, we're returning soon and then, and have it be relatively blank and never put your logo on that slide. And then at the end, thank you for watching. And you might put a call to action in there or something like that. The, the thank you for watching. I don't do as much anymore because I prefer just to fade to black. I don't, I don't think, unless I have something to say, if I don't have a front sell, if I don't, if I'm not trying to sell you somewhere, then I'm not going to put, I'm just going to go to black. If I want to sell you on something, then I'll put something out. Go ahead, Courtney, real quick. Um, I don't know, real quick, but it's, it's, uh, this happened uh, to a live event I did during the pandemic. I was a product, I was the uh, tele, teleprompter operator. And they didn't have a chance. They were so late. The producers were so bad. It was an award show where they were giving awards away to people. And they had video packages of each person that was receiving the award <clears throat> that would give you the background on each person. And they didn't have time to test each video that came in from third parties. All the videos were coming in from oh. third parties before the show. And so we get into the show and the two hosts are up there reading the intros and everything. And, and now let's take a look and on the big screen and, you know, it, it starts to play and the video plays in about 10 seconds and then starts again and plays in about 10 seconds and starts again. Every single video did this. <clears throat> they didn't. <laughs> so throughout the entire show, the hosts had to go, let's take a look at Maybe we shouldn't take a look at the video. <laughs> right. Yeah. I mean, it, they just didn't have any way to compensate. And without testing those videos, play them through from beginning to end when you yeah. get them, because you don't know what codec it was created with. And this is probably what the cause of the problem was created on a different system and playing back on a different system. 
always test your videos all the way through from beginning to end before the show starts. They were well, playing and, back a YouTube video, you know, so relatively speaking, this shouldn't have been too hard. And I'll say, by the way, state the obvious, you know, they're friends of the show and this is, you know, meant to really just be constructive yeah. to learn from. And, uh, and I think Alex's point is exactly it. You know, someone underestimated as simple as this chore should have been to play back, a switch between a person and a playback of a YouTube video problem still happened. And by the way, you know, they did stream to YouTube, as Alex mentioned. So now this whole show is still there, is it le at least I last take, time I checked. I'm surprised it's still there. I would have taken it down. And if folks remember, Apple uh, live streamed, and then I think for a couple of years did not live stream to make sure nothing went wrong. And then I guess once everything was worked out, the bugs well, were worked out, I, then I they live that, streamed their events. I don't think anything went wrong necessarily. I think with Apple, there was a concern of wanting to really make sure that the press showed up, you know, like that, so that not having a stream was making sure that there was no way to get the information before everyone got it at the same time. They had to all have it there. Um, and so, and then when Apple got to a point where it just didn't matter anymore, they were able to go back to streaming it. But even then, you know, you'll notice that, you know, they didn't just leave a stream up. There was always like a little gap between after the keynote before the other one, get, you know, went up just to make sure that everything was fine. But, but yeah, the, the thing is, is that there's so much rehearsal to, to what Courtney's talking about. You know, when I do an event before the moderator, so you even think about the moderator for the events that I work on right now, before the, I hire actors in the location that I'm at. And they, uh, we do the entire show over and over and over again with all the playbacks, with all the bits and pieces, with actors um, sitting in for the moderator and for the people that are going to be, you know, being asked questions and so on and so forth. So that when the moderator shows up, we take the one actor that was the moderator out, put the moderator in, and we've got a bunch of people that already know how this is all going to work. And we're only talking about the moderator. <laughs> so the moderator is just orient orienting themselves to what we're doing. And then, but our team has seen all of those videos, seen the, because we, we're working out camera angles and we're working out cuts and we're working out the playback issues and we're working out all those things in those rehearsals. And we don't even want to do it with any talent, including the moderator there until we get to a point where we're like, we feel like it's running smoothly. Then the moderator can come in and do that. But those are the kind of things, those, that's the level of detail. And if you're going to, if you're not going to put that kind of effort into it, just post a video. Like they could have just streamed a video. Like, like you know, if you're not, you know, like the, 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 my whole thing about, about live in general is you don't need to make it live. So if you're going to do live, you're going to do interaction, you're going to do those things. We do it because we take questions. <laughs> We're interacting with people. We need to go live. But if you don't need to do live, it's a huge liability with very, with so many risks. Um, and you should just do it anyway. We... It's important for us to look at that. And so I would recommend people watch it and just realize that how dangerous live can be. And it's just really, you know, you, you have to, we do it here all the time and people see live, but there's an enormous amount of preparation to do it correctly. And, and if you don't, you end up with shows like yesterday. Uh, next question. Tim Mann in Melbourne, Australia is up next. I have a multi-track audio file recorded in Tracks Live. Is there a way of importing it into Reaper? Go, Jeff. Yeah, I, I'm only guessing that you must not have that installed and perhaps you have that file. I wasn't able, at least at a quick glance, to see what the file structure looks like um, if it's just saved from that. But it appears to still be uh, downloadable from Wave's website, uh, both Mac and Windows. And it does have the ability, once you have that installed, to export and you can export either to just a stereo mix uh, or a stem so that uh, every channel will be a separate track and then you can bring that into Reaper or, or any DAW. Go ahead, Lucas. Yeah, I also took a look at it and uh, you actually can't export stems. It uh, says that the function uh, seems to be there, but it is not working on Wave's website. So uh, their workaround is to actually go to into the folder, the project folder and uh, go to uh, interchange. That was would be the name of the folder where your files uh, would be. Uh, so if you just need the files, I think copying them over would work if you would need anything more like the project structure. I think there's no way to export the project in some kind of AAF or something. So if you just need the files, I'd look in that folder. 
Is there a reason that you would record in tracks live instead of just recording into Reaper? Is it, or just that's what happened to happen? What, what, what do we think? Uh, so there's, I think there's not anymore a reason because uh, Waves actually says you should use Reaper to record from Wave Sound Grid. So I, I assume it's an old project, uh, but it. there, it's not not. Uh, it's they stopped developing. So I think there's no reason to do it now. Okay. Yeah. So so if it's an old project, definitely pull it out. If it's a, if you're still using it, then it sounds like the best thing to do is stop. <laughs> that was my so, take is that he has that file, but he's not the one that recorded that. That, that, that was my read on it. That makes sense. That makes sense. Uh, next question. Samuel Nordvik in Norway is up next. Thoughts on the newly released Shure MV X2U audio interface that can be attached directly to an XLR microphone. Seems like an interesting product for a travel kit to take it along with something like an SM58. Go ahead, Courtney. It does look uh, interesting. It It's... Uh, Probably a little bit expensive. Uh, it's 129 bucks. Uh, you could get a small mixer for that, but for a travel kit that would fit into your into your uh, bag, uh, into your laptop bag, it, it looks like it might do the trick. It it takes that uh, XLR input and uh, puts it on a USB uh, C connector and brings it into your computer. I assume as a dual stereo or mono. I'm not sure whether it brings it in on both tracks of a stereo signal over USB into your computer. You do have a uh, headphone jack on the bottom of it, so you can listen to return audio from a USB from your laptop, I think. But it does have an app that has to go with it to, to change the settings and control it, because it does have uh, apparently 48-volt phantom that can be turned on, so if you have a condenser microphone, it can be plugged into that. Um, so it looks pretty handy. I'm not sure who's... Uh, a to D converter, they're using probably Texas Instruments. So it makes sense. 48 kilohertz mm -hmm. uh, sample rate. Sound looks good. Good, Bill. I'm not sure if this is any different, but I used to have a device from MX, MXL that did pretty much all of this. It had it, And I, I found it pretty useful. I used it for a while when I was on the road. The nice thing about it is that the little headphone jack built into the digitizer, I guess that's what you call this, to take the analog microphone signal off of just a plug-in on the bottom and turn it into a digital signal out via USB. But the headphone jack was real-time, so there wasn't any latency or anything like that. So I used to use it occasionally to do field stuff. I eventually moved on from it, but I'm not sure if this is any different. That yeah, was a useful tool. Yeah, the preamp in the MXL was pretty bad. <laughs> like yeah, I, yeah. I had that one too. The um, uh, I had a I've I've had a lot of these. These are um, I I for a long time I had an X2U, which is the predecessor to this, which is actually a little bit more expensive than this one, I think, um, in my bag, and I just had it all the time because it always meant that I could I could convert an XLR signal to a um, you know, to, to, a, a digital signal. So, um, it's a little, it was like just a little bullet slight, twice as big as this one. So the only thing that I would say is that I'm not that excited about the fact they took all the controls off of it. So there's no headphone control. There's no, uh, gain control that's actually on it. Both the Sentrance and the X2U had those controls directly on the device. So the idea that I, and here's the issue is that if I'm sending this out with a kit to somebody, which I might try to do, um, I can't, it's now they have to download some software to set the settings. Now, if, if it's set and forget, maybe I can get away with it, but it's a little bit of a bummer that I, that I have to grab it. The advantage is if I send this out with a kit, like a, then it comes with a computer, then I could theoretically, you know, now I can open up that computer interface and change their mic gains and so on and so forth. So there's, there's potentially some advantages there. I, I, I'll have to check. I, it's super useful. The fact that it, it, it's got an, a 60 dB, um, sensitivity is really useful. That means that, you know, our, a lot of the, of the mics that we've had trouble with in the past uh, should be, um, you know, a very, you know, being able to manage that well. So I think that that's, it's, it's going to be great at hundred, again, at $129, I think it's like $60 less than the last one I bought from them. Um, and we used to have lots of them floating around. And so I think it's actually a pretty good deal for what it does. Um, and it's nice to see it updated so that we can use USB-C, um, I will, I, I have to admit, I this was sent to me a little bit earlier. Um, and uh, I tried to buy it on Amazon immediately. And um, it's not there. It's, I think you have to go to full compass or something like that. So so for me, it was a it was a must have in, in the bag again. Um, so uh, so I think it's a it, it looks like a, a great interface. Next question. Douglas Carmichael's up next, and Douglas says the majority record, or the major record companies are suing the Internet Archive for preserving old 78 RPM recordings for the public. Overreach or justifiable protection of copyright? Good, Courtney. 
Well, if the record companies own the copyright, uh, I guess it's justifiable. If if they're going to make available those same 78s for purchase or download uh, from the record company, I guess you could call it not overreach. Uh, it kind of works. I, I'm kind of against this because a historical recordings, I think, should eventually become public domain. And I think 78s are since they keep changing the copyright laws are now back under no longer public domain because it's 50 years after the death of the original artist. Uh, so uh, I guess it allows them to go in and, and try and capitalize on it, but I'm against it, but uh, I would like to see older stuff that's past, older than 40 or you know, 30 or 40 years old be put into public domain and made available for search and for history. Good, Bill. I come down in exactly the same size of this. These old 78s, one of the things about this initiative that the archive did was that they wanted to record them with pops and snaps. They wanted to preserve the state of the old recording as it was done. They're not really trying to rip off the content as much as they are trying to build this archive so people can understand the old technology that is rapidly disappearing. These recordings are often on really terrible materials, old acetates and things like that, that you drop them once, and if it's a rare recording that has somehow survived, it's gone. So I'm kind of on the side of uh, this is historic, important information, and I think, you know, come on, record companies, you've got a plenty of ways to make money in the modern era. Trying to go after a 78 recorder is probably not one of your best options. I mean, you can probably try to find other things to do. I think the challenge is, is that if you know someone is violating your copyright and you don't, you don't um, uh, manage that, if you don't actually take them to court, then it puts the copyright at, at risk. So, so they, you know, so I think that that might be part of the problem there. I just think our copyright laws have gotten out of control. And I think that they're slowly getting tucked back because of the various fights right now um, in Florida and Congress. Um, as a result, the copyright laws are not being updated. Um, and they were, they've were they been being updated for the last 50 years or something like that to basically protect Mickey Mouse. And um, suddenly it stopped. <laughs> so the so the copyright now is starting to creep forward. Um, and, uh, and so I think that that is, um, that's good for all of us, you know, because I think that copyright should be 50 years from the release period. Like so, and then it should go into the, I mean, we have to allow things. The reason that they're, one of the big reasons they don't want to do that is because we became so productive when we had all this electronic uh, capture. So if you did that, um, you'd have, you know, right now the Beatles, no, the Beatles, everything from 1973. So everything before 1973 would be open, would be, would be in the, uh, in the open domain. Uh, and and uh, that would mean that people would just it'd make it really hard to release new content because if you have free old content, no one will go back to the, no one will listen to the new stuff because they can do so much with the old stuff. Uh, Courtney, real quick. Yeah, I think for historical record, the thing to consider is that technology is moving so fast. The obsolescence of the technology needed to play it back may be unavailable in 50 years. So things will be lost to history. You think of all the photographs taken on digital cameras that are stored on hard drives somewhere. They're just going to disappear when you can't find a hard drive or anything to play them back on right. uh, because they're not human readable. Yeah. No, absolutely. Uh, a uh, quick reminder that, you, of course, you can ask questions throughout the hour. So um, go ahead and throw those questions in. If you have general questions uh, about um, media production, uh, virtual production, go ahead and throw them in right now for the first hour. And for the second hour, you can um, live audio preparation. You can throw those in right now as well. We've got a couple of questions coming in for that. Uh, and, of course, remember to vote on those questions um, because uh, we'd like to know what order you'd like us to answer them in. All right, let's go to the next question. Stefan uh, Fischer, Wurzburg, Germany. Can the new DJI LiDAR scanner be used to autofocus a Blackmagic Pocket Cinema Camera 6K through the using the autofocus capabilities of a Canon 28-70 to lens so that an, initial, an additional motor to adjust the focus is not needed? And he's got a link there to the DJI LiDAR product. Go ahead, Courtney. No, I doubt it. That thing, uh, uh, the DJI is designed for manual focus lenses. Uh, it does work with a little uh, motor and a drive wheel to drive a ring around any manual focus lens. To tie into the autofocus of a Canon would be very difficult since that information is, the autofocus is done inside the lens and the information goes through the pogo pins on the lens and you'd have to intercept it somewhere inside the camera. I don't know if it's gonna be accessible from the outside by the LiDAR. 
it's possible if they worked out a deal with Canon, but I don't know if they have it. It doesn't mention anything like that. Yeah. So. I don't think it would. Um, you know, you, you need the motor to, to do that. But it looks really great. I wonder if it's the same. I'm going to guess it's the same lighter they're using in the 40 camera that they have. Uh, maybe maybe without all the same controls, but it's probably the same sensor. Uh, it, it may potentially work significantly better than most cameras because the lighter, it's, it's sampling so many things in depth. Um, so it's really, really fascinating. Um, and so I, 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 yeah, it's, it looks like a really great thing to put on, put on a camera. <laughs> so we'll have to take a look at it. Hopefully we can get a test unit in and uh, we'll take a look. Next question. Lucas Herzog, Baines, Germany. Up next, since YouTube separated videos from live streams, some people complain about the lesser visibility of live streams on their channels. Any tips on how to feature these mo more, those more prominently? Go ahead, Jeff. I agree, by the way. I'm not a fan of, of breaking them apart separately. I think uh, it would be my preference that they are just videos and, and perhaps some visual distinction or something about it to indicate that that was at one point live. Um, but yes, I mean, I, I frequently do not go looking to see if there's a difference and miss stuff. So that's where people, uh, first of all, take advantage of YouTube shorts. So they'll take clips from that, the best clips and use them as kind of uh, trailers. And same thing with just creating videos that you post as a video which is just a short preview and and both of those you know uh you, you have a call out in the video uh whether text on screen and then certainly the description and link to the video in the description and those end up actually being very great ways to promote something that was live that they won't find because you're you're taking the best of just like a movie trailer yeah, and you're going to probably find that we're going to do something that probably responds to that a little bit in in this case. So we're slowly working towards uh, the ability to we're going to you know cut up what we're doing here into some smaller pieces. Um, and uh, when you see that, what you're going to see is a very high resolution version of it going up um, right after the show. Our live version will actually probably become unlisted over time, and probably be, they'll both coexist for a little while. And then after that, the live one will become unlisted, so we don't create any dead links if someone was linking to it during the show. Um, but uh, and then the the only ones will be the videos that we put out, and so so we're working towards that. Um, hopefully by the end of the month, um, we'll we'll have something. We'll either just we may just start just cutting. We're, we want to dice up the whole first hour. That may not happen immediately. So what we probably do is end up just cutting the show in half um, to you know to um, and put it up as separate pieces. And so we're gonna you'll see us start to experiment with that in the next couple of weeks. Go ahead, Lucas. And do you want to do it even smaller, like every question, or is it just two one-hour blocks? The goal then? is every question. Um, so you'll you'll notice that I'm trying to be pretty disciplined about saying um, the, the, the what I say right before we go into another question, and um, and then what we're working on is trying to get an AI script to uh, look at it and then slice those up into into pieces for us. Um, the advantage of that is really that. Over time, we could use, you know, we could start to flow those into playlists. So all the audio answers go into one playlist, all the videos go into another playlist. There's lots of playlists that could be built on YouTube that, and theoretically, at some point, we could be doing that in a semi-automated way. You know, so all of those, and the idea is that then if you just want to listen to audio, you can just listen to audio answers. If you just want to listen to video, you can listen to video. If you just want to listen to all the questions that have been asked in the first hour for the next six hours, you can just do that. And so, so I think that that's the, um, you know, like, you know, just keep on listening to them and it just keeps going into the past and it just keeps building on the top. Um, and so it's probably something we should have done a year ago or two years ago, but we're doing it now. Um, and, um, and so I'm not very past oriented. So I just go, well, this is the new thing that we're going to do. So, uh, we're trying to get that kind of sorted out right now. Um, but I think it's going to make it much easier. And again, it will, and we may also play around with some, you know, snippets and so on and so forth. So, um, there'll be a lot more, we're kind of focusing more as we go into the fall on VOD. So there'll be little how-tos and little close-ups and reviews and things that'll happen that I'll probably start until we get kind of figure it out. And then we'll encourage people if they want to, um, to, um, to build their own. So we'll, we're going to kind of fig figure out the model and then, and then see what people want to do. Go ahead, Jeff. The great thing, of course, about that is that then those clips and snippets, they can live in more than one playlist, which is great. Yeah. So they can satisfy a number of topics. Uh, on the flip side, you know, I'll say with, with folks that I've seen take entire live shows 
and it was a live show, so it shows up there live, and then they will do a fully edited version of the full show and post that as a video. And, you know, so the unfortunate issue there is that each of the videos are competing for views. So either one of those. And that's why we're going to unlist ours. So once the other one, once one video is up, the live will disappear. Right. And so that that's, of course, that'll prevent the problem from that point forward to whatever extent there were live viewers that Canada's views, those won't, you know, be views on the video that's posted. But yes, that's the, that's the only issue with that is, is that to some extent, at least you split the views. I don't care. Like, like, I mean, I think that that's the thing is I'm not, I don't measure what we're doing by the number of views. So I don't really care whether there's lower view numbers or not. So that's, that's the difference for me. Um, this is really what we really think of is, is producing these as a service to our, to our members, you know, of just, just how to make it easier for people to, to find, to, to look at it. And, and most people are very view oriented. How many views did I get on this? And it's just not something that I'm, I'm not, I'm as concerned about. I also know that as we start to, what we'll also see is that there'll be some answers or some questions that are there that um, suddenly get 10,000 views and uh, that are, that were held back by being in, being clumped into a bunch of other things. So as we open it up, all those individual, uh, all of the individual interactions uh, will free up some of the questions to get a, a much wider range, you know, of what they're doing. But to your point, I don't want to confuse people by having both at the, up at the same time. Next question. Paul Wallace in Austin, Texas. What's the best to mount, best way to mount a Melee or B-Link to a big screen TV? And what wireless keyboard and mouse or trackpad with a keyboard do you recommend with it? I only have one word, super glue. Okay, well, it's two words, but super glue. Like super that. glue. <laughs> Never come off. <laughs> go, ahead, go ahead, Courtney. I read that question a little bit different as not best way to mount, but what's the best to mount a Melee or a B-Link to a big screen? So I took it to be, you know, which is better, Melee or B-Link. And I, I would have to say uh, a B-Link, I mean, a Melee is probably the best. I like this Melee, which is the PCG-02. It depends on what you're going to be doing. If you're trying to play video games or something, go with a B-Link that can have a, a much beefier processor in it. This has a, 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 a J4125, which is a quad-core Celeron uh, they're about 179 bucks on Amazon. It has a gigabit Ethernet in it. And the nice thing about this, this model, and not like the other Melee models, is it has an external Wi-Fi and Bluetooth antenna so that you can get the antenna away from the back of the TV a little bit. So that greatly improves your, your Bluetooth uh, range. And as far as keyboards to use for them, I like using the, uh, uh, this is an ASIO a uh, little mini keyboard. It has a, a pretty broad layout and it has this little uh, sensor over over here, which is the mouse. It's a little optical sensor you rub your thumb across uh, to move the mouse around uh, and it works quite well. It uses a dongle little plug into the USB port so it doesn't use uh, a Bluetooth. But as far as Bluetooth goes, I use uh, these which are RII that are 2.4 gigahertz mini wireless keyboard and they make a Bluetooth version of it as well. And I use the Bluetooth version of that and it's backlit so you can use it in a dark room and uh, it has a touchpad on it and a full QWERTY keyboard including the F keys which is uh, uh, for me uh, essential. It's hard to find a little mini keyboard that has uh, function keys on it uh, because I have a lot of software that uses the function keys. So that's what I would use and I'd yeah. mount it to the back uh, with, uh, you know, you got to be careful with some good, uh, good uh, uh, dual lock Velcro. And the, um, the Melees that I bought have this little bracket. Um, so this is the little bracket here. And this, this little bracket comes with the Melees, at least the ones that I purchased. So this is the uh, Quiet or 3 or whatever. Um, and, um, and basically this bracket um, will go on to the Melee like like that so it'll it'll attach to it it's got little screws and then these pieces here are both 75 and 100 millimeter v, uh, uh, visa mounts so so this would go right under the attachment now if you have something that goes under it it's, it's not going to work but but there there it is built to possibly give you a way to attach this directly to the back of your television and at least the ones that i bought came with them next question 
Next one comes from Aaron Giccarelli in uh, Flagstaff, Arizona. How do you send ambisonic sound to YouTube? You know, I don't know how to send ambisonic, and it's something I'm, I'm, I, uh, I'm going to test because I, I do believe that it supports ambisonic right now, um, but I haven't, I haven't done it. We've been doing 5.1, so basically we're... Um, uh, uh, we're doing the conversion in, uh, so basically we're taking the ambisonic and then converting it to 5.1. Um, and so, and then, and then send, sending it into YouTube there. So that's, it's a little bit of a different, um, uh, thing. And the question is, is do you want to record it or do you want to go live? So there's, and there's a bunch of different ways to do that. Um, the, uh, and for some reason, again, the name, uh, Mickey can probably put this in the comments, but I can't, I can't, I can't remember the name. Dear VR is the one that I'm most familiar with. And so there's another one that we're actually using though for our live shows. Um, and for some reason it escaped, the name escapes my, uh, my, uh, my mind right now. So, so anyway, so the, um, uh, but we, uh, Har Harpex. So Harpex is what we're using for, um, so Harpex is what we're, uh, we're using live in through Pro Tools. So basically the way our pipeline's working is ambisonic is we have uh, four channels of ambisonic and two channels of, of mics those get those get embedded into an sdi signal which is handed to the live view the live view then sends that out it's received in our office it gets de-embedded it goes into pro tools with harpex that those, those four ambisonic signals get converted to 5.1 and then they're re-embedded back into the signal before it's streamed out and that, and so then at the same time the video goes through the fshdr gets converted from s log to uh pq 2020 and then it, and then it, and then it gets converted there and then it's sent to youtube as an hdr 10 um, 5.1 signal so that's how that that's how that process works um but I think you can put ambisonic, you can just stream ambisonic with it, but I'm not a hundred percent sure. So we'll have to take a look at that. It might only be binaural that, that it takes there, but we'll, we'll take a look at that. Um, I just got a hold of another ambisonic mic, so we'll, we'll see how that goes too. So, um, so we're going to be testing this a lot. We're going to be talking about ambisonic a lot more. So stay tuned for a lot more discussion about ambisonic and surround in general. Go ahead, Lucas. Yeah, I just looked it up uh, in, in the YouTube help and it seems like at the moment uh, you can uh, stream first order ambisonics, but only if you also use the 360 video. So that might be a limitation. Yeah, so and we're, we want to use it um, without that. We want to use it with, um, uh, we want to be able to incorporate it into the stream for re rather con regular rectilinear. Um, so. So anyway, so stay tuned. We're, we're going to be doing more. In fact, um, I'm, I have a goal to change our countdown clock, the countdown clock that you see there. Um, my goal is to change that countdown clock to a, um, uh, to something that is using 5.1 and, and so on and so forth uh, there. So uh, I'm just starting to record some of the pieces for it. Um, so we'll, so stay tuned. We're, I'm basically taking a spherical shot. So I'm going to take a, um, you know, a, a um, taking the sphere, uh, you know, with a theta so that I have a reflection map. And then I'm going to put the, have the letters going down, but being lit by that reflection map. So, and then, but then shooting a background plate so that the goal is, is that the, the letters will look like they're really lit well inside of whatever environment I'm shooting. And then you'll also hear all the birds and whatever, wherever the goal is to shoot this really cool background plate and then shoot a reflection map and then put the, then put the, the text into it. So I know that it sounds a little over the top, but it's going to be really, I think it's going to be really cool when you'll, you'll see lots of California, um, in, uh, and, and get to hear birds from different parts or wherever I am in the world. Um, you'll get to hear the, the birds. <laughs> so we'll see, we'll see how it goes. Uh, next question. Robin Cutshaw in Atlanta, Georgia is up next. I have some JBL 305P Mark II speakers that will stop putting out sound every few weeks. A power cycle fixes it uh, for another few weeks. Anyone seen this? I go ahead, Bill. No, not at all. And in fact, I turned my 305 Mark IIs on maybe three years ago, and I have never turned them off. And every morning they just start and work. So I think something's wrong. Uh, you know, you've probably done the standard things and make sure that it's not the feed uh, delivered to them through the XLR cables and that the, you know, power is where it's supposed to be. But I, I would think that there's some component inside that needs to be rebooted in order to do it. They're active speakers, so they have little power amps in them. So something's gone wrong. So I get them serviced. Yeah, the um, uh, Mickey uh, suggests to disable power saving mode, which I didn't even know these speakers had. <laughs> Go ahead, Courtney. Yeah. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. Power saving mode, or if it does have a, 
a heat problem. It could be just dried out. Uh, if there's an internal heat sink or an external heat sink in there, it could be that heat sink compound is dried out. If you're, you're out of warranty, take them apart, put new heat sink compound on it, put them back together, and that may bring it back to life. It could be shutting down because of thermal overload. I'll have to go back and look. I have one right here. <laughs> I didn't know that there was a power saving mode to turn off. Uh, next question. Eric Hertz in Hartford, Connecticut. Do you ever send your program feed out via NDI to another system or perhaps to a studio monitor? Yes, that's actually the primary way we use it. <laughs> go ahead, Locus. Yeah, I just wanted to say the same. We uh, Sometimes when we are doing uh, streamings, uh, we have another room where we need a monitor, like a green room or something. And and yeah, it's just uh, easy uh, to use when we, when we have the wiring in the building already. Next question. John Fultz in Sealings Grove, Pennsylvania. Has anyone used the Allen & Heath DT20X Dante interface? We haven't used it. I think it's only a couple... Um, channels is it just two channels it's just uh i think it's just two channels and i think that for i guess the advantage here that this would have over getting the audinate version is this this will probably support 48 volt so so you can um you can yeah you have, fa for, you have phantom power um so you know the the audinate little cables are line only um so you have a little bit more control here you have some gain control um to make that actually work it looks like actually a pretty good product i could i actually can think of a couple ways that i could that I should be using this, <laughs> so so we'll take a we'll take a closer um, closer look at that. So it's three hundred twenty nine dollars, which is actually a pretty good price for those two channels, especially if you're going to have a little bit of gain, um, you know, that that's built into it. I know we have this. This could be a really good one if you have a um, if you just have a microphone that that you want to drop down and you know for like a podcast or something like that um, that you just want to convert it to Dante immediately. This could be a a pretty useful way to um, to make that actually happen. It's a little bit like a it reminds me of a little bit of like the sound devices mm1 if, if they if sound devices updated it not that i'm bitter uh next question next question comes from douglas carmichael illinois passed a law requiring children to be compensated for appearing in their parents's monetized social media content thoughts and it's got a link there go bill yeah, you know, this has been since the dawn of time. I remember reading about the horrible time Shirley Temple had as a little girl because her parents kind of pushed her into modeling and acting. You know, she had a fabulous career and maybe on on, on balance. She became an ambassador. Yeah. I mean, she had a great <laughs> life. She was a smart young lady. But her early, early days were very tough because her parents were those kind of stage parents who pushed her out. And we still hear things. I mean, that, that whole blindside actor right now is going through the, hey, you know, I became famous and this became a famous story, but I lost a lot of the money. My parents got kind of rich doing it. That's the allegation, at least. Hasn't gone to court. So... You know, everything is easy until big money starts Fine. rolling in. And then, boy, do people suddenly have all sorts of control issues with giving up that oh. pot of money. Britney Spears is pretty salty. And that's, that's, <laughs> she's, she's pretty upset about it. She wasn't even a child. <laughs> she, she's, yeah. she's, 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 pretty, she's pretty angry. Um, yeah. So, I mean, I think that you definitely have to look at how, um, you know, I, I think that um, how that's managed, I think it makes sense. I think the hard part is, is it's really hard to, like, what they, the stipulations there are, it has to make at least 10 cents a play um so just be clear that's about twice what youtube pays <laughs> so 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 if the kids are in a social media uh thing uh network that is um and i think my guess is i mean when i saw the 10 cents a play in that bill i think that the industry just went in and said well that's fine but why don't we do it 10 cents a play which is more than anybody is getting paid and so this bill actually doesn't work like it's it it literally for the for what it says it's doing, it's completely not doing it <laughs> because nobody gets paid ten cents a play. That's if you're selling a disc or something. If you so if you're selling uh, discs or you're selling a song, but there's no play on TikTok or YouTube or Facebook or Instagram um, that is generally getting advertising rates over. 10 cents a play. So it would only be if they were getting um, direct sponsorship that would pay a much higher rate, a considerably higher rate. But that is, you know, 10 cents a per per play is very high. Um, and so so I think that that's a, I mean, because that's a, I think it's a $100 CPM, which is just a 
giant number. So, so I, I don't think that that's, <laughs> I don't think that's happening anytime soon. So I think that the, our poor little lawmakers got horn, horn swoggled. <laughs> so, so they, 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 they got to do a press release and I guess they feel good about themselves, but they've been, uh, they, they've been fooled. Um, there's nothing there. Next question. Henry Ramos in Yonkers, New York. Any way to restore NP F970 batteries? Uh, for example, I have one that was left on an LED light and fully discharged. It will not accept a charge. Oh, uh, they die. They're they're now e waste. Uh, the 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 uh, I, I, F970s will take a certain number of charges and they just stop taking charges. If you leave them on the charger for a long time, it'll shorten how much how long that lasts. If you leave them on a device for a, for a long time, it'll shorten how long they last. Um, you need to take them off where they are and keep them stored separately, and then charge them up um, when you need them. But don't leave them with with heavy charges. They are not. They're fragile. You know, like they, they really are. I go through it. They're, fortunately, they're not very expensive anymore either. But, but they are, um, but you do have to treat them with some, uh, some level of respect um, because they, I've gone through many, maybe, I don't want to say hundreds, but many 970s. <laughs> so, so, and you just, they just become an e-waste proce process. And so that's, that's the nature of that technology. Go ahead, Bill. I've had the same experience. I was interested to see that newer, our friends with the N-E-E-W-E-R thing, have a new 970 replacement that has, interestingly, other power taps on it. I think it has a USB-C and some things so it can function as a little battery uh, device as well as a clip-on battery for things that run on 970s. So it I will say that the, the non-Sony ones last a lot less <laughs> than the Sony ones as well. So the Sony ones, you know, the original Sony ones are a lot more expensive and there's a reason for it. Go ahead, Courtney. Well, that's exactly what I was going to point out. You can buy the Chinese knockoffs for about one tenth the cost of the brand named Sony. And there's a lot of counterfeit ones out there. And a lot of times you'll get them and they'll only have uh, two cells inside of them in parallel instead of four cells. So uh, you got to be careful about them. And if you're going to store them and put them away, charge them up and then discharge them to about 70%. And you should put, put uh, nickel metal hydrides. Uh, and uh, lithium ions away at about a 70% charge if you're going to store them a long time. Don't store them in a depleted state and don't store them in a fully charged state. Yeah, and and it's, um, but this is an old technology. I mean, it's been around now for 15 years and so it's not, it doesn't have all the new stuff that the new kids have. Um, I really have been, been enjoying, I, I got these, I got hooked on these small rig 99s that have um, multiple barrels and USB-C and D-tap on them. And, um, you know, I, we've got, we, we were using three of them for the show the other day and, and they work great. Um, next question. Next question comes from Jeff Cohen in Miami Beach, Florida. Gain staging. Do I understand this correctly? If the gain for dialogue is significantly too low, mouth sounds and clicks will be disproportionately loud once the audio is normalized. Go ahead, Bill. Well, applying anything like compression or limiting or something like that, that that suppresses dynamic range. And that's basically for people who are new to audio. It's the difference between the softest sounds and the loudest sounds. If you're talking into a microphone, theoretically, your words are the loudest things that the microphone is being hit. And those little interstitial noises like clicks and pops and mouth sounds and I've got too much saliva, those things will be much lower in volume than the primary content. Now, when you compress things and limit dynamic range, you're bringing up the bottom as well as sometimes capping the top, and that means those clicks and pops will be more prevalent. We talk about this a lot in the narrators groups, people who have to do a lot of long work for an audiobook or something like that. We go through periods and there's just tons of talking about how to eliminate those little mouth sounds through the course of it. There are automated tools that can do it, but yeah, uh, those kind of compression things will bring to the fore those kinds of sounds, and you have to deal with it some way. The automated tools like, um, uh, oh, what's the big one, uh, iso Isotope, have algorithms built into them to identify that and suppress them. They can really help a lot. Go ahead, Jeff. And and what I'm asking about specifically, I mean, uh, uh, and thank you, Bill, of course that's true with uh, compression and, and any dynamics adjustment is that we're going to bring all that stuff up, the noise and everything else and the cars honking in the background just when Courtney's trying to give us his gems and, and everything else. But as it was explained to me, and this is what I'm trying to verify, the difference with specifically these mouth sounds and clicks 
uh, again, as it was explained, is that these are mechanical. So unlike our voice, which can fluctuate in volume soft to very loud, they're mechanical and, uh, and the, and the combination of the frequency means that that's going to be different than anything else that's going to um, kind of be fixed versus the relative range of the uh, the voice of where it may fluctuate. So that then when you go and normalize and compress and everything else, now they're going to be, again, disproportionately loud. And I'm trying yeah, to figure out if someone I, playing a joke just... on me, if that's true. Uh, someone's playing a joke on you. It's, it's just, it's just the, it, all that stuff is there. I, it's the noise floor that's the problem. Like the noise floor, you're pulling up a bunch of stuff from the noise floor, but everything gets louder. It, it, there's no proportional, proportionalness to it. Uh, go ahead, Lucas. Yeah, if you just normalize, you just normalize to a specific point, whatever that is, and you would make every sound louder. So the relation between the sounds stay the same. Everything gets louder or yep. The quieter, so it, the the thing uh, that th those clicks get louder only uh, would happen if you apply compression. That, I mean, the, the issue that we get into really is if you think about the you know our what we're doing here, and you think about the noise floor. The noise floor is static; it's like at negative whatever the, whatever your amp, your preamp, everything else. It's living like somewhere in here, right? And your if you're if you've got the proper gain. You have, you know, your peaks are up, you know, somewhere up in here. And so there's a lot of distance between those two and you won't really hear it. But if you, um, if your, if your gain is too low and you're down in here, now a big chunk of your, of your signal is sitting inside of that noise floor. So that when you, when you stretch this up, you're just pulling all of this with you and it's all intermingled. So the thing, the key is, is that you want that to be as, as, you know, as within reason, you want that, that separation between the noise floor. So that's, that's why your preamps matter. When I say, oh, that has a bad preamp, it's a noisy preamp, you know, or, or I don't like analog mixers because they add noise. You know, they keep on adding noise, so they keep on building up this noise floor here, and it can, you, you keep on stacking stuff on top of it, and you end up, and you go through too many analog devices, um, and you end up with a lot of noise, and then, then this has to be even, even higher there. So I think that those are the things, but it's not, it's not the, what they're saying that's the problem or the, or the, or the direct signal. It's how close that signal is or how embedded it is into that noise floor so that when you stretch it out normalize it it just brings all of that out with it it's not no no one no one likes that go ahead courtney uh i disagree on a couple of things uh i agree it is it's about signal to oh, it's happening with my video there uh, signal to noise ratio and if you're considering the mouth sounds to be the noise not self noise self noise is constant uh, regardless of where the microphone is or how loud the person is, you know, it'll be at a constant level because it's generated inside the electronics of the microphone in your sound chain. But uh, mouth sounds are acoustical sounds, and they don't really vary in, in amplitude. Your voice can vary in amplitude. So the best way to get rid of the mouth sounds is to have somebody speak louder, move the microphone further away, because with the inverse square law, the low energy of those mouth sounds, which are just sounds of saliva popping and sliding around inside your teeth and your lips, um, if you move the microphone a little further away and tell the person to speak a little louder, then you'll get a little more signal to noise ratio. The uh, mouth sounds will be much lower with respect to the voice at that distance. And uh, the microphone may not be able to pick them up. And then when you normalize them, uh, you won't hear the mouth sounds as much. All right, sorry, go ahead, Bill. Well, I wish my mouth sounds were all consistent and the noise part of this. Remember, noise is anything you don't want. So it, it, regardless of its source, I can see quiet clicks and I can see loud clicks. And those two things I see all the time in my long form audiobook narrations. So there's variability in everything. Sometimes I'm, you know, back and kind of really talking about a loud character and sometimes it's a very quiet and interpunct thing and the amount of mouth so noise against that just is different all the time this is a, this is a variable art we're getting ready to go into our second hour just a quick reminder that uh, we have uh, yeah, tomorrow my brother will be on he'll be here, here in my house uh, downstairs we're going to figure that out uh, and he's going to have a, a steady cam with a trinity rig uh, so um, we're going to be talking about uh, steady cams and trinities and how they work and what makes them different so stay tuned for that in uh, that's going to be tomorrow morning and then of course we have the zoom team here 
on Friday. And so um, uh, so Andy and Jonathan and Sam will be here to talk about new Zoom features. Um, so we're pretty excited to have that. That's usually action packed with lots of things that we can um, that we can ask them. So um, so stay tuned for that. It should be a lot of fun. And of course, Saturday is going to be two hours of Q&A and Sunday is going to be our retrospection. It's a good time to ask questions about the system itself. So um, so stay tuned for all of those. And now we're getting ready to jump into the second hour. And we're starting the second hour here, and we and so Marty has been pulling this together, uh, this this conversation, um, and and he's got um, some some great guests here, um, Ed Willock and, and and Andy Lipnick, and we're going to I'm going to hand this off to Marty to start the conversation, and Marty, you're gonna you're gonna kind of ask those you know have the conversation, then come back to questions. Is that is that right? Oh, can't hear you. Yes. Okay. Okay, great. Hi, yeah. So, yeah, um, uh, Ed, we have Ed Willick here and Andy Lipnick here, and we're going to talk about, <clears throat> um, you know, what, what, how do you approach any live event in terms of mixing and in terms of the entire process of, of the event? Um, there's so many different kinds of events from you know, small corporate meetings where you might put a full range speakers up on stands. Uh, there may be larger events where you're hanging speakers, line arrays from, from the ceiling or from the grid. Uh, there are events where you may have 20 microphones around a, a panelist table that, um, you know, people are taking turns addressing with a, a moderator at the head of the table. Uh, there are award shows where there's a huge stage, lots of microphones on stage, people coming on and off who may each be wearing wireless microphones, um, different needs. And, and then, of course, there are music events where you have you know, all kinds of instruments on stage, multiple singers, background singers, lead singers, people trade off. Um, I was at a I was at a, a show just this last weekend where it was a music event, sort of kind of a festival, but not your typical festival. There were 57 musicians who were coming on and off stage, mixing it up to play uh, you know, music from a particular artist. It was a tribute show. So it was a really complex kind of event because guitars are coming on and off and singers are coming on and off. And it was and they pulled it off really well. But you know what? It, that takes an incredible amount of planning and preparation to make sure that you know exactly where everything is on your console. When somebody plugs in a guitar to an amp and it's coming up on a channel, where is that channel? There's no room for error because once the song starts, everything's got to be there. Um, and, you know, I, I, I kind of think that you know, mixing is kind of like cooking, right? You've got all these ingredients and how you prep them and how you treat them and when you put them together and how you put them together, it all affects the outcome of the dish. And in order to do that, you, you have to have, you have to go into it with some concept of what that final product is going to be. And then you got to figure out how you're going to get there and what you need to do. Um, and you can't just keep piling things on top of other things because as in cooking, you need to know if you're doing a one dish meal, you need to know what the size and shape of that serving plate is because you, as, as Ed was telling me yesterday when we were talking, you just can't keep ladling soup into a bowl. At some point, you've got to stop and you, you can't, there's no more capacity. So Ed, Tell us about the kind of uh, the kind of work that you find yourself doing, because um, I came from music recording and network radio and television and corporate events and um, lots of things. But you have some different experiences. Yeah, thanks, Marty. Um, and uh, thanks for having me back uh, at Office Hours. It's been a while since I've uh, been here. I'm glad I was uh, invited today. So uh, thank you, guys. It's good to see everyone. Um, yeah, my, my career, I mean, started in music, um, kind of that cliche of a musician who then gets into doing audio. Um, so of course, you know, being a musician as a kid, 
got into doing recording at home first. And then um, being a kid, you know, a high school aged uh, musician, there weren't a lot of places to play. So I started putting on my own shows and then said, hey, I don't want to pay someone to bring a PA. So I started buying PA gear. And then, you know, many, many, many thousands of dollars later, uh, I do this for a living. So uh, I came from the music world originally, um, mixing shows, uh, recording bands, things like that. And then moved into corporate uh, a little bit later, you know, uh, as they say, rock and roll dreams go to die in corporate AV. So uh, that was kind of where uh, where I ended up. And that's uh, what I do a lot of. Uh, I still do a lot of music, um, especially summers. I'll do like summer festivals and uh, I mix monitors a lot for those. But that's kind of where I came from. Uh, and these days I do a lot of those corporate large um, conferences, town halls, um, some with most of the time nowadays with broadcast elements, um, sometimes just broadcast, uh, for streams and things like that, but, uh, usually in the corporate space. So great. That's Andy, kind of my how, about, background. how about you, Andy? What, what's your current, uh, where do you find yourself currently in the business? What kind of events are you doing? And by the way, I apologize for this streak of light coming in through oh, my yeah, window. Look at that. It's, uh, it's morning here in San Francisco. Um, I'm sorry. The question was, how, how did I come to doing what I do? Now, what kind uh, of, what kind of work are you doing right now? Oh, uh, my bread and butter work is corporate events. Um, and it's either, uh, most of my clients are production companies themselves. Um, and, uh, sometimes I'll, I'll work for the end client directly. Uh, there, there's a, there's a couple of companies I do their quarterly meetings. Um, and then there's, uh, the, when I work for production companies, it can be anything. It can be like a small meeting, a medium meeting, a large meeting. Um, there may be a music element that's added to it because they're, they're doing some sort of uh, end of the year celebration, things like that. So it kind of runs the gambit. Great. Well, and, and I, occasionally I do get to do pure music, which is really nice. Uh, yeah, that's always, I love doing music when yeah. I get the chance and it's not often enough. Exactly. So, so when I'm approaching an event, when I'm hired for an event, there are certain things that I want to know, right? And, and 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 this goes for every every kind of event. It's a universal truth. There are things you need to know and, and, and things you need to, to prepare for. And one, you know, those are like, well, what's the event? What's the nature of the event? Who's going to be on stage? What's the program going to be like? What's the size of the room? Um, <clears throat> what uh, what equipment am I going to have to to choose from, or can I, or am I specifying the equipment, or is it coming from the production company's own uh, inventory? Um, if I'm working with point source speakers that are going to be on sticks, or if I'm working with a larger system, that tells me about how loud the I can get it in the room, and when I know the characteristics of the room, I'll know what my reverberation and feedback potential is. And so I need to think about where I'm going to place those speakers in relation to the stage, uh, what kind of microphones I'm going to be using. Are there podium microphones on goosenecks? Are they handheld uh, wireless microphones? Are they lavaliers? Uh, are they head warns? All of these things will feed into how I approach the system. Um, because then I'll want to know, well, do I need how many channels of auto mixing, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And if it's a corporate event, you know, I'm, that's a certain style that I can approach. And if it's a music event, that's a completely different thing because I'll need DI boxes and I'll need many, many, many more inputs. And I'll think about, well, then I need to know from the bands exactly what they're going to be sending me. So I'll get an input list from the band. And uh, Ed, why don't you take over on that point? Um, so, sorry, so approaches, um, there's all sorts of things that are important uh, in preparation. Um, I, I'm one of those people who loves to get as much information about a show ahead of time as possible. Um, I typically work as a freelancer so when I get a call, I'll ask, hey, can I get drawings? Can I get, you know, some information? Is there a run of show? Which obviously there will never be a run of show until pretty much the last minute. And anything I get is going to be a sheet of lies anyway. So um, I basically look at these things as like, how much information can I get ahead of time? Is there a previous show 
like uh, a lot of the events I do happen year after year. So what was last year's, you know, send me that, send me a pull sheet for the gear that's coming in. And then um, from there, I can make the decisions about, um, you know, what I'm going to do and how I'm going to approach it. Um, as, as you said, Marty, sometimes it's speakers on sticks around a ballroom. Sometimes it's line arrays in a giant uh, exhibit hall. It all really kind of depends um, on the corporate side. And, you know, obviously concerts were in arenas and, and uh, you know, clubs and venues and stuff. So uh, sometimes I don't have any choices. Sometimes I'm get, I get handed things and it's uh, make this work. And uh, we do. And um, when that's the case, it's, you know, how can we most efficiently put things together and and also, what's my role? Am I just the mixer? Do I have someone who's a system tech or am I doing that role too? Do I have an RF person or am I doing RF as well? Um, and then I kind of prioritize, you know, what needs to get done, how it needs to get done. Um, do I have a crew that I can delegate things to or am I going to be doing all of it on site? Um, so the more the more prepared I can be going into something is uh, kind of what I aim for if possible. Um, and then we kind of know, you know, the, once you do a bunch of events, you kind of know the things that you're going to have to provide. You know, um, I think Marty, you and I were talking the other day. I used to do a lot of these dance shows at a theater where it was like dance schools uh, coming in and doing their recitals. And I always knew that I was going to get a lot of different file types very last minute. So I'd have to have CDs ready. Uh, imagine that still CDs. Uh, I'd have to have an iPod plug in. I'd have to I, sometimes I'd be getting a flash drive to throw into QLab or whatever. And then I also knew that last minute, five seconds before a show, we would get a videographer who needs a feed. So it wouldn't be on my sheet necessarily of uh, things to prepare, but I knew that was going to be coming. So I'd get that prepared in advance. So just uh, being able to anticipate and uh, from your experience, knowing what shows you've done and having things ready and, and whatnot, that's kind of my go-to for how I start thinking about a show when I get booked on something. And when I when I'm approaching a show that I usually approach it from the direction of the output first. That's what I want to know first, and and I work my way back towards the inputs. Um, do you, Andy? Do, is that do you have a different approach? Uh, similar, very similar to that. Uh, I mean, I've been doing it long enough where I kind of work, think about both ends, uh, and work towards the middle. Perhaps I don't know, but um, yeah. And uh, so we have, you know, output. What is, where are your destinations? Well, we, we know we've got speakers in the rooms. Um, we need to know what the volume capacity is um, on those. How loud can it be? What's the characteristics of the room? But then we have other destinations too. We might have stage monitors, uh, wedges on the floor. Uh, we have broadcast. We have comms that we might need to feed. We might have a backstage monitor that we need to feed. Um, all kinds of other outputs and destinations that we have to consider. And each of those would, might be a different mix. There may be some mix minuses that we need to set up. And will they be pre or post send on any particular fader? Some may be pre, some may be post. Um, what will be included in the broadcast mix? Uh, and there might be more than one. There might be a clean feed and there, uh, or an international feed, or there might be a local feed, and they may have different announcers. And so you've got to set those up. Uh, but then, you know, it all comes down to the inputs eventually, right? And you need to be absolutely certain that you've selected the right microphones, the microphones are placed properly, and they're at the right distance and the right angle, uh, especially if you're doing music, um, I've seen I've seen guitar amplifiers on the floor with an SM57, which is a cardioid front address microphone, hung over the handle and pointed down at the floor instead of at the loudspeaker, and that's just picking up all kinds of reflections. And it's a sound you may like it, but it's not really what the amplifier is putting out. Um, uh, <clears throat> there's all kinds of techniques and philosophies about how to mic a guitar amplifier and how to mic other instruments. And we're, we're not going to get into those right now, but uh, suffice, it, suffice it to say that <clears throat> you need to have a clean input signal from each instrument with 
and minimize any kind of bleed from other instruments. Um, I have I have tracks, and maybe we'll get to playing some of them, where I have a microphone on a, for example, a stand-up bass. Um, no, on a cello, right? But that microphone, I mean, right next to the cello is a, a, a saxophone. And that microphone is picking up both instruments and makes it difficult for me to isolate the bass in order to adjust its level in the mix. That's a problem. You know, that's a real problem. And can kind of overcome it if you're post-mixing a recording, but when you're doing it live, there are no second chances and there are no redos. So you've got to get it right on the stage, get the right microphone, the right angle, the right distance, so that you have clean inputs to work with. Uh, what do you say um, we go to some questions? See what there is. Absolutely. No problem at all. Uh, our first one comes from TJ Worrell in Minneapolis, Minnesota. And TJ says, live corporate event, no band, general sessions, awards banquet. What submixes do you send to Video Village for the history record? Stage mics, pre-record video playback, audience mics. What's your best practice in this? And let's start with uh, Andrew Lipnick here. Uh, apps definitely send a full program mix. Um, that's everything. Um, sometimes it's not the, the voice of God, mic in the room, but uh, it's everything. Um, sometimes video will ask for ISOs. Uh, in this case, they might ask for, um, for example, if they're doing a fireside chat and they want those two people separated because they're going to do some post-production later. Really though, I have to say that most of the time they're going to use the program mix because your job is to make that sound as good as possible so that they don't have to do a lot of work later on. A lot of times too, these things get turned around very quickly. So there's that. Um, but yeah, we um, sometimes they'll ask for a lot of all the stuff split out and in either they might actually ask you to do the multi-track record too. Um, it's nice. Some of these new consoles have that ability on board. Um, if not, you know, send it out to Pro Tools or Reaper or your the DAW of your choice. Yeah. Lucas, what say you? Yeah, I think for me, it's kind of the same. It's uh, either they want the full program mix and they go with it. And uh, sometimes if I'm do just doing a front of house, they uh, I'll add some... Uh, um, room mics uh, to it and that's the best i can do and the other thing is yeah could we have everything uh, separately so and then i'll do a pro tools or reaper rig and try to capture it all which i mean for some shows is a great idea regardless because you can do virtual sound checks uh, for the next show if it's repeating or something like that so uh, that might you might be already doing that Ed. Uh, yeah, I'll just echo what they said. You know, program, obviously, you're going to give a full program. Um, but again, talking to your records or your client op, sorry, your record op or your client, um, sometimes they might want not want the walk in, walk out music um, in that program. So you might be doing a mix minus. Uh, as Andy said, VOG mics sometimes will not go to the record, sometimes they will. Uh, broadcast and streams, typically we will not send any uh, copyright music if there is walk-ons that are, um, you know, play-ons or anything that are copyright. Um, and, uh, you know, you'll have different music going to the stream during breaks on a multi-session kind of show. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's uh, you know, check in with uh, the, the person uh, writing the check or the operator, find out what you want, they want. Um, and then, yeah, ISO records if, uh, if needed, if it's going to be edited later on. Um, Sometimes you're sending feeds to cameras direct. Uh, sometimes you're sending them also to record deck. So there, there might be multiple places that you're, you're sending these feeds. You know, you bring up an interesting thing, copyright music and play-ons and playoffs. Have you been snapped by that? Because I keep going to concerts and I keep hearing pop music played, and I'm pretty sure they don't have ASCAP rights, ASCAP rights to that kind of stuff. Uh, on streams, streams will get taken down for sure. Um, and typically, I mean, we usually have non-copyright music for that purpose, but um, there still are some shows where they hand you a Spotify playlist and uh, that's what, what you roll with. So, uh, you know, it, it's out there, but uh, it can definitely on a stream, stream get you popped for sure. Snappy on the back end. Marty, you had a thought? Yeah. Um, 
if you're for playing walk-in music or or you know in the venue uh the venues generally have because they're performing music all the time they have licenses for you know uh performing music and for playing music in the venue streaming is a completely different license and you'll generally play stream safe music but it's ultimately you know it's the client's liability if they tell you they want this played well then you know <clears throat> if the stream gets shut down uh, that's that's their own deal there you go next question comes to us from dave troutman in edmonton canada what's your policy on providing live feeds for media and third parties and let's start with ed willick here ed uh, yeah, so that comes down to client. I always ask the client um, what we're what their policy on that is. There's a lot of things that you don't want to be the one who released information that wasn't supposed to go out to media or a third party. Um, often, if there is going to be media on site that are getting a, a feed, we'll have a press box, and that'll be part of the you know one of the mixes that we're setting up. We'll send a malt, and and people will be able to plug into that and get the feed that they need. Otherwise, I don't prepare uh, recordings for third parties unless uh, specifically instructed to by the client. And it's always good to just get clarification before you go ahead and do something like that. Marty. Yeah, a, a client will know, you know, whether they have invited press or um, even sometimes even the corporate uh, PR department might come in and set up cameras uh, and, and the client will know that in advance and they will see the cameras there. And if they have a problem with it, they will send them away. Um, but the client doesn't always communicate to me in advance whether I'll need to prepare uh, a feed for, you know, third party cameras. Uh, so, I, you know, it's it's not terribly difficult to get that going uh, in something like an X32 or any uh, digital console. Um, provided that, you know, the camera crew is bringing the cable, bringing the wires, it has an XLR port, uh, that they're going to plug into my mixer or my stage box or whatever I can pull out to provide to them. Uh, Andrew. Yeah. A couple of points is, uh, what Ed and Marty said, uh, we are the gatekeepers for that often. Um, if we are not told ahead of time and, um, in that case, I will say, hey, you need to go talk to the production manager or whoever is in charge. Uh, the other point I want to make is uh, sometimes these crews, especially press, will just be running in and they'll plug in their wireless transmitter. And I'll, I'll put on the press box, no RF without checking with the A1 or A2. Um, and sometimes no RF at all. Uh, if it's a really large event, they have to go through an RF coordinator. So the, that's kind of important. You don't want them stepping on your, your frequencies. Absolutely. Uh, Lucas. Yeah, just one addition. It's uh, if you prepare this uh, in advance, especially for smaller clients that might not have told you in advance that there's someone coming, I always have something prepared. Uh, and it's also quite helpful if you can adjust the volume of that output uh, uh, separate from everything else because some of those press teams will not really know how their inputs on their camera systems work i have had that a few times when they said wow this is loud now this is just line level but yeah it's always helpful if you can help them out by turning it down on your side excellent next question comes to us from Aaron Giancarelli of Flagstaff, Arizona. What's your best practices for live audio? Well, there's a narrow, simple question. Who wants to take a shot at what are the top absolute couple of best practices that you guys have run into that if you don't do it, you just know things are going to go completely south fast? Let's start with Marty and then go to Ed. Okay, for me, the, the first thing I want to know is how loud does the client want it to be? What if they say 12 out of 10? <laughs> you know, um, it, I am so glad that the, the volume wars are finally dying. Um, I've been to so many events where I can't be in the room without wearing earplugs. And if I have to, if people have to wear earplugs, then why not just turn it down? I mean, it 
doesn't have to. Just because you have three gigawatts of power doesn't mean you have to use the, every one of them. <laughs> You know, I, yeah, in, in defense, I used to be in a loud room and play music back. And I found that over the course of time, if you do that day after day, now it may be different in gigs that are separated by time, but I, my hearing just, I kept turning it up more and more and more because I was just getting fatigued. I couldn't tell how loud it was. That's really dangerous. Ed Willick. Yeah. So like the 10,000 foot view uh, is, sig uh, you know, input signal and gain structure. Um, as the saying goes, you can't polish a turd. So you have to get the best sound from the source that you can at the beginning of the chain. Otherwise, everything down the line is going to be affected by it. So, you know, no, no distorting at the preamp, you know, don't have the microphone pointed the absolute wrong direction. Things like that uh, are, are super simple, but that those are paramount getting the signal right. Um, from there, it's understanding your destinations, as we kind of have been talking about a little bit. Uh, where does audio need to go? What needs to go to each of those destinations? What doesn't need to go? to those destinations is actually almost more important sometimes. Um, you know, if you've all heard of hot mic moments, uh, obviously you don't want to, uh, to send the wrong thing to the wrong place that's live. Um, so yeah, the, those are kind of the, the big best practices is, you know, understand where things are going, get your signals uh, aligned uh, from the beginning, get, you know, the best possible placement, uh, you know, and, and not distorting your preamps and things like that. Uh, cause it's just going to make your job much, much harder. Hey guys, I'm sorry for my audio quality. I'm going to jump in here. Uh, they asked me to, to, uh, to hop in, uh, next, uh, is Andrew, Andrew. Hi. Uh, yeah. So I always think of the user and that means speakers and understanding your space. So uh, speaker placement can have a huge impact on everything else down the line. So if you've got good speaker coverage, they're in, they're in a good location for the audience, they're not gonna pick up too much of the, of the sound coming back from microphones. Uh, that's a beautiful thing. So on that's one end. The other end is, uh, and Ed touched on this, is mics. Are they aimed in the right place? If you're using lav mics, get them up in a nice position so that they're not down by their navel, but they're up where they should be. Uh, headset mics, whatever mics you're using, those two things on either. And if you think of it, those are on either end of the signal chain. Um, and then you fill in the middle uh, with with good gain structure, you know, good EQ, all of that. My favorite is when people take a stick mic and use it as a gesture stick. Uh, Jeff Cohen. You know, I just want to give the the counterpoint of for Bill's question about volume. You know, if if we're talking about a speaker um, talking to an audience, that's one thing. I mean, if we're talking about music in a concert, you know, there's something to be said for feeling the music from all those giant towers of speakers and you know depending on what kind of music it is certainly you know uh electronic you know you you go to some of these big venues and you know your your organs are shaking you know your drink is shaking like the dinosaur from jurassic park is coming up on you so there's you know that's part of the event i think when we're talking about music uh let's go to the next question TJ Worrell in Minneapolis up next. Is there a non-manufacturer specific software that will create a 3D model of a line array coverage for a room? I need to evaluate a prospective vendor's response to an RFP. Have they specified the proper array for the ballroom? Ed? Uh, yeah, so uh, Ease Focus is um, is a software that'll, that is uh, product agnostic, but it also has a dat huge database of speakers available. Uh, and you can import uh, manufacturer GLLs, and then you can build or import your venue to do the acoustic model simulation. Um, there are free and paid versions, but yeah, the Ease, uh, Ease Focus is going to be the the product agnostic or brand agnostic, not coming from a specific speaker manufacturer that uh, lets you do that. You know, with the advent of uh, Pro Tools and then Avid, where audio goes, video will follow. And it's, it's very interesting to watch all the, um, the various pieces of software that get used for analyzing stuff. This Marty Cook. Yeah. I'm just noting that this is for a ballroom and the, um, 
uh, one thing to pay attention to is how many different uses and how many different kinds of setups and orientations will the ballroom be capable of? Uh, if you're setting up a line array in a ballroom on a permanent basis, then that kind of locks the room into just that one orientation where the stage will be under and behind the the line. Yeah, nobody, nobody's going to put a line array for a permanent install in a ballroom. This is a I, has I, to be I, I, a specific I thing. Seen, I have seen it. No, that person <laughs> should not be in this business anymore. Let's go to the next question. Next one comes from Tommy Shantz in St. Paul, Minnesota. The X32 has been a stalwart machine for many events, but what mixer are folks looking at replacing that with? Is there anything new in that price range that will do everything and maybe more that the venerated X32 does? I love this question. We have a great piece of equipment. It's been working fine. I want something new. Uh, Ed? Uh, yeah, so, and, and to Chris, to your point, the X32... I think in that price point is a very good choice. Uh, it does a whole lot, um, but it is getting to be long in the tooth. And uh, unfortunately, support and parts uh, has been declining. That's why people are looking for other alternatives. Um, and th there's just no real uh, continued development on that product line. So um, what's been very popular lately has been the Allen & Heath SQ series. Um, so like the SQ5, 6, and 7, depending on what size frame you need, uh, is in that same similar price point. Uh, and then beyond that, Alan Heath has the Avantis, which is like a, a next step up, but not the big jump to something huge. Um, Yamaha also just recently came out with the uh, DM3, which will have a standard uh, and a Dante version. So the standard has no, does not have Dante. The Dante version does. Um which will, uh, I think the standard's out already. The non-Dante, the, the Dante version has not um, hit the shelves yet. But uh, that might be a good uh, replacement for smaller places, uh, House of Worship, things like that. Breakout rooms, it's actually going to be a really good console for. Um, but those are kind of the the top options as far as I'm concerned, the the SQ or the, the new offerings from Yamaha. So, Ed, a question for you, follow-up. Uh, yep. Do you think, um, do you think that given the the last three years uh, recoiling from uh, COVID, all the supply chain issues, do you think we're, and then take a look at the economy now, do you think we're at a point where it's kind of like pre-madness where we will see continued development? I think a lot of development got uh, stilted because of all the issues for the last few years, yeah? Uh, I agree, yeah. So, uh, but it also gave them time to develop new products. Um, so it's kind of uh, a little bit of both. And so Behringer, who makes the X32, for example, they came out with the Wing, which is uh, their next step up console. Uh, and kind of the timing of it didn't really help. It had been out a little before the pandemic, but obviously the pandemic slowed that down. Um, and then bigger consoles like uh, Midas came out with their Heritage uh, D, which is the HD96. That hit right at the beginning of the pandemic and it like killed the momentum because now there weren't big shows that people needed consoles for. So the pandemic absolutely um, put a damper on things. Uh, the DM3 that I mentioned earlier, uh, that was actually supposed to come out a couple of years ago, uh, but the pandemic stopped that because the chips from Dante, uh, from Audinate were not available and other chips that Yamaha couldn't get. So there's a whole bunch of uh, factors at play for sure. Um, and hopefully we do start seeing some, some bigger uh, players come into the market and uh, and bringing us new stuff because a lot of those consoles, they had a two, three year pretty much uh, stay where they had to keep these older products uh, yeah. out there just because they couldn't really release them. So I think you're absolutely right, Chris. We we should see some new stuff coming out. Uh, I just don't know what the time frame for that's going to yeah. be. Marty, quickly. Yeah, so the X32, the M32, I mean, one of the things that made made them so popular aside from the price is the sheer amount of information that's presented to you on the surface of the mixer. I mean, you've got pretty much real meters on every fader. You've got all of that information. The view buttons on each of the segments makes it really, really easy to navigate around the board. Um, and so if you're looking for, when you're looking at other consoles, um, I would recommend, you know, trying to find rentals so that you can get your hands on it 
and check out the workflow um, because if you are if you like the X32 workflow, you know that board has some limitations, and that's perfectly fine for that price point. It is incredibly flexible, um, nevertheless. But if you go to another console like the QUs, for instance, from Allen Heath, they um, uh, you know I personally I, I'm not a fan of that workflow. But if you move up to the Yamahas, every board has their own philosophy and their workflow and the information that's provided and the way you navigate through the system. So make sure you like that workflow before you make that investment. And next question, which comes to us from Henry Ramos in Yonkers, New York. When receiving a house feed for a live stream, the best practices for incorporating crowd applause or reactions. And I don't think anybody has raised a hand yet on this one. Um, Oh, there we go. Chris Fenwick, Marty Adius, and Ed Willock. So we're going to start with Chris and go to Marty. Chris, first up. I don't I don't know if I'm allowed to answer and I'll leave. I'm so, sorry for the audio quality. A um, couple of things. You have to have a lot. What I would do is I would take the house feed and then add my own effects mics. I would use shotguns and I would use some, some art, other large diaphragms for warmth. You have to have multiple shots because what ends up happening is like a shotgun reaching out into the audience you'll get one person who's like crazy. They have a a cackling laugh. Um, I had a friend of mine who did a lot of worship albums and they'd have people like pull a tambourine out of their purse. And and all of a sudden like that mic is dead for the night. So you have to have, you have to have many mics, as many as you can afford tracks, track assignments. Um, And you, you just have to have variety, but different types of mics. I had the same problem once with a with an ongoing gig and there was a PZM on the ceiling. That was the only audience mic. And yeah, you're right. The worst person would always sit under it with some honking laugh or something and half the audio would go bad. Marty Adius, bring us back to normal here. Yeah, if you're going to set up audience mics, and that's a really good practice for, for streaming, when you have audience in the room, you, you want to give your people at home the impression and the understanding that there is a crowd there. And so if you, um, uh, shotgun mics are good, you, but the longer the mic, the more directional it is. So you can use shorter shotgun mics and get a broader spread and, you know, avoid picking up that one person that it's pointed at. But um, height is your friend on these things. Higher you get it over the crowd and you're pointing it down, you're covering a larger space. Um, but if I'm taking a house feed for my stream, um, I will always set up my own microphones on the podium uh, when possible because I don't want to have to be totally reliant on the house engineer to send me good audio. Ed Willick. Uh, yeah, so as as uh, has been said, audience mics, uh, shotguns typically on the stage, facing the audience, uh, sometimes hung from a uh, lighting truss pointed down. Uh, I've done that uh, plenty of times. Um, as far as audience response, though, handheld mics with a mic runner is king. Um, I've done events with the catch box, though, and that's been kind of fun for the audience. The thing doesn't sound super great. It takes a bit to dial it in. It's kind of muffly. It's like talking, uh, you know, underwater. Um, Ed, can you define a catch box for people who might not be used to the term oh, the thrown mic? Yeah, yeah. So catch box is a soft cube that uh, you put a wireless lavalier microphone pack in. It has the mic element already built into it, but you put the pack in, you close it up, and people can throw it, literally throw it to each other. Uh, you catch it, and then you talk into the top of the uh, the cube. It has a, you know, a circle where people are supposed to talk into it. Um, and it's it's a cool kind of quirky thing. You know, um, I actually did an ESPN event where they were using the catch box, and um, they had three people who were throwing them, I think three people was too many, um, and uh, it has to be. I think it has to be wrangled. Uh, the the issue I I've seen with it was all three wranglers threw all three catch boxes out, and then all three of the people holding them were looking at them like, "Are you going to go? Are you going to go? Who's going? Who's you know?" So uh, I always recommend with the catch box have two wranglers, two catch boxes. One wrangler throws. And while the person's answering the question, the second wrangler throws, and then the first wrangler gets the catch box back to throw to the third. Um, but yeah, they're they're cool. They they uh, they're just fun. You know, the audi- it keeps the audience on their toes too. You know, if, when you're throwing microphones at them. But uh, uh, but yeah, uh, audience response uh, stick mic is absolutely. Um, you need to hear the audience, especially in the day that we're streaming pretty much every 
events, it's no more of the, uh, you know, oh, they'll they'll hear me shout my question. No, it, it's not for the people in the room. It's for the people online. And we, we harp a lot on the inverse square principle. Getting mics close to people is what improves that signal to noise ratio, ratio faster than anything else. Lucas, thoughts? Yeah, uh, just a little addition. It might be totally obvious, but if you do this live, also think about latencies because when you get the house feed, it's pre-amplification, then it gets amplified, and then depending on where you, you place the mics in the audience, there's way the sound has to go. So if you don't uh, counter that when you uh, do a live mix, you'll uh, get um, a comp filtering. So um, you have to take that into account as well. Next question comes from Dave Troutman in Edmonton, Canada. Recently, I watched a PA operator wandering around the crowd with an iPad to adjust the mix. Is this becoming a common practice? Andy. Uh, I use iPads more on the setup, especially if uh, it's a smaller gig. I don't have a, there isn't a full audio crew. So um, I'll check things. I, I might go on stage with a lav mic and stand up there and EQ the system and things like that. Uh, and then the only other time that I generally will use it is at the very beginning of that type of show where I don't have another pair of ears. Um, maybe I don't know the A2 if I have one. Um, but if I know the A2 and I trust them, I'm going to say, hey, look, can you walk around and just tell me how it sounds? Um, because everything changes with an audience in the room. Uh, you know, your your room is going to change in terms of sound. Uh, but sometimes I will just, if there's, I'll look at the agenda and I'll say, do I have time to step away from my position and just take a minute or two to walk around with an iPad and just listen to the room with an audience in there? And then I'll come back and then I'll put the thing away um, generally. Okay, Marty. Yeah, some people are more comfortable with, uh, you know, controlling Mixer from a tablet than others. Uh, it's not my favorite thing to do, but it, I find it highly useful. Um, as Andy said, I will always, uh, if I'm, you know, using microphones on a stage for a talking event, um, I will always go up and with my tablet, talk into the microphones, bring up the volume as loud as I can before feedback, and then, you know, do some notching to eliminate those the, those feedback points, uh, especially when I'm using lobs because they are just more prone to it. But um, uh, even after the show starts, so uh, also, as Andy said, uh, the room changes when there are people in it. They're absorbing sound and uh, reflections are different and acoustics are different. But even so, um, the sound coverage in a room, especially on a portable event, is not going to be extremely even. And so I'll want to walk around and take a listen and see who's hearing what and who's not hearing what. And maybe maybe I'll walk up to a loudspeaker and, and shift the position a little bit, you know, rotate it on the stand. Or I may uh, change a little bit of EQ uh, because something is sounding harsh in one part of the room. Uh, so it's really useful to have that ability to make adjustments on the mixer while you're out there hearing what the audience is hearing. Ed. Yeah, as Andy said, uh, and Marty said, uh, definitely in the setup, uh, crucial so that you can, you know, do those sorts of things like ringing the room out and all that. Um, I, uh, unlike Andy, I typically, as soon as um, I'm kind of done and I'm in the show, I keep my iPad up all the time because it gives me a separate extra window uh, of my console. So I can pull up a different screen. Um, I can have like the RTA, uh, which is a real-time analyzer showing me things on the... Um, there's all sorts of things, but there's also consoles where I actually prefer the workflow on the iPad app. Um, some of the Soundcraft uh, lower end consoles, uh, like the Expression or the Impact series, um, when you're doing like a real small show, the the iPad app is actually you know more useful to me sometimes than the console, uh, just because of how the the touch screen responds and things like that. So uh, definitely a tool that I use all the time. Um, and then different types of events, uh, that's right. Uh, things like galas or weddings. Uh, if I happen to be mixing a wedding band, uh, most of the time the con the mixing board gets shoved side stage. And the only way to get any sort of understanding of what it sounds like out front is to take the iPad and go out there. So, um, iPad is always with me on every single show I do, as well as a wireless router so that I can, uh, connect it to the console. 
And it brings up a good point too. Sometimes the iPad becomes the cheap monitor mix console. If you have an, a separate operator for monitors who's standing side stage, uh, yeah, they'll have an iPad sometimes instead of a full on console with a full split mix. Nice, nice thought. Next question comes to us from Aaron Jean Carroll in Flagstaff, Arizona. For a small PA setup, what's your preferred audio board and why? And it looks like everyone wants to touch this one. So we're going to start with Marty. Marty? For a small setup, um, I will never object to an X32 Compact. Um, it's, it's small, it's portable, it's extremely capable. But the, the new Yamaha mixer that Ed was talking about sounds extremely interesting. And wasn't there another small digital console that came out a couple of months ago? I don't remember what it was. Maybe somebody else does. I'm not seeing any hands up, so uh, maybe somebody will know as we go through the group. Andy? Uh, I'm a big fan of the Yamaha QL1 for a small setup. Um, lately, I've been given uh, uh, the Allen & Heath SQ5s to mix with. Um it's kind of a different workflow than the Yamaha, but uh, both consoles are really good and they're nice small form factors. Lucas. Yeah, for me, it's also the uh, Q QL1 and I'm really looking forward to try the DM series. Uh, I haven't yet, so. Ed Woolick. Yeah, I'm uh, I'm gonna also be in the QL1 uh, family. I uh, I actually have one sitting next to me. That's what I use for my shows here. Um, it's, uh, definitely my top, uh, choice, uh, followed by an X32 compact. If, uh, if we're really, uh, looking at size, I avoid the producer cause it doesn't have the scribble strips. Uh, so the compact, uh, is the one on the X32 size again for space. And then it would be the SQ5 after that. Um, I'm not the biggest fan of the, the workflow. As Andy said, it's very different than the Yamaha's, uh, and there's a couple of quirks on it. Uh, I think it's a great sounding board. I just, the workflow for me doesn't, doesn't work so great. Um, and then I avoid, as I mentioned, I think earlier, like the sound craft. I don't, there's certain ones I don't like the pros, presonus, things like that. I love that. No scribble ship. No, nope, not, not coming in my show. <laughs> Next question. It comes to us from Carlos Rojas in Washington, DC, prepping kids for college. What's a good microphone selection to record medium to large classroom size lectures using a tablet or a laptop? And Marty's going to start us off. Marty. Yeah, that's a tough one. Um, and if you're thinking about connecting a microphone at the laptop and you're somewhere in the classroom theater, uh, good luck with that one. Uh, you're just too far from the source unless you happen to be sitting directly under a ceiling loudspeaker and point it straight up. Um, uh, you know, other options are to get uh, uh, a RODE-GO wireless microphone and set it up on the podium, but then a lot of lecturers tend to walk around. Um, so that's that's a real tough situation. Uh, they're, they're in some more advanced classrooms, especially at the college level, uh, there may be a feed available, a wireless feed available that you can uh, tap into. You'd have to ask about that. Yeah, that's tough. I remember in some of the lectures that I had to cover, uh, getting a little micro cassette recorder and just putting it next to a speaker on stage or something like that. It's really tough when you've got that much difference. And I think some of those old recorders used to be very limited bandwidth, and it was perfectly in the speech range, and they sounded terrible. I'd hate to listen to it for a long time, and it was painful to listen to an hour lecture back on that. But at least it would get the content, which is sometimes all you're looking for. Next question comes to us from Eric Price in Kansas City. For live stage music events that will be recorded and streamed later, what are the basic components required to make that second mix? And where in the system is this feed pulled out? Andy, start us off. Uh, I'll do it two ways. Uh, if, it's, if there's no music, I'll just use the main mix, uh, the main left right on the board, because that way I always have meters right in front of me. Uh, for what's going out to most of your audience, usually, you know, a lot of times uh, the in-room audience is the smaller of the two. Um, if there's live music with guitar amps on stage and all of that, it becomes a little trickier because, um, for example, uh, on the former, where there's no live band on stage, the PA becomes your monitor if you're doing both mixes. So, you know, having a good PA mix 
those relative volume levels are going to translate pretty well. I'll always put on headphones occasionally to make sure that mix is right. With a band on stage where there's loud guitar amplifiers, those feeds hitting your, what's going into the room is going to be down and less because you're getting stage volume. So it becomes more important to use uh, a separate mix on your console to, uh, you know, send that out to your records for the band and all of that. Um, Marty? I think I covered that correctly. Whoops, Marty, you're muted. This is something that I pounded out in, you know, in the Hybrid Ministries uh, series uh, for, for church sound is that uh, the streaming mix, especially when there's live music, the streaming mix will be completely different from the house mix for the loudspeakers for a number of reasons. Uh, dynamic range is one of them. The house mix can have a huge dynamic range with the loudspeakers, but the streaming mix has a total dynamic range of probably 10 dB. And so you've you've got to do your mix differently. The other reason is that, as Andy was just saying, not everything on stage needs to be amplified in the loudspeakers, but everything needs to be mic'd and everything needs to be mixed into the stream. If it's just a talking event, then yes, you can do the house mix and send it out. However, there are times when somebody will talk, step up to a microphone and they'll be a little too far from the microphone or they'll be, they'll be a very soft speaker and you just can't bring them up in the house because additional gain will cause ringing or feedback. But if you're doing a post-mix sends to a bus for your stream, then you have that additional mix where you can make individual adjustments on channels that won't affect the house mix. And so you always have that. I, I would normally start out with all of the input faders to this bus at Unity Game, but then I can make individual adjustments uh, while I'm listening to what's going to that feed. Ed? Uh, yeah, a lot, a lot of what Marty said, uh, I agree with. Um, you know, set, setting up a separate uh, mix bus that is for your stream. Um, you know, there's there's different schools of thoughts with it. Uh, as Marty said, a post fader mix. So with the sends to the the stream mix bus at Unity to start, will get you a copy of what you're doing in the house, and then from there you can make adjustments to the sends on that bus to accommodate. You know, account for what Andy was talking about, where like the guitars in the room are going to be adding to the the volume in the room. You know, remember it's sound reinforcement is what we do. So what we uh, you'll end up having to do for your stream mix is bring those up, for example, because even though they're loud in the room, they're not going to be super loud going to that mix. So having that uh, that ability and that flexibility to adjust those mixes and then obviously monitoring them with with in-ears or, or headphones, or if you can have somebody else doing that, again, maybe on an iPad in a different room, then you've got you know uh, a way to check that. Um, otherwise, uh, I've done a lot of these where if it needs to just be a two mix, like it needs to be a quick turnaround or something, then th the, the bus is going to work. Otherwise, I'll do stems sometimes where I'll send a stereo mix of drums, a stereo mix of guitars, bass tracks, a stereo mix of background vocals and vocals and, and multi-track the stems. Or if you can, to do uh, fully isolated multi-tracks and then mix it down later, that's obviously going to give you the most flexibility possible. Lucas? But then also print, sorry, also oh, print your house mix so that if you are going to mix this thing later you can hear what you you know you you have a a, a full two track program mix like that you did in the house just so that you have some other reference to hear what was going on lucas yeah i think in a perfect world the best thing to do would be to split all the signals and have two consoles two uh a1s and two mixes but that's obviously not always the case so i'll second the ipad thing we that's something we have done uh sometimes just give them an ipad and uh, uh there's for some consoles there's even apps you can uh, you can um configure to just be able to adjust one bus or one um whatever it's called on that console aux mix or something so they can't interfere with your mix so sometimes that's an option too 
move on to the next question. Chris Sabato, Albany, Oregon, says, using an X32 to mix broadcast audio as well as comms, is there any reason to do the broadcast mix in a mix bus as opposed to doing it in the main mix? Ed? Uh, if that's all you're doing, if you're only doing the broadcast mix, then sure, do it on the main mix. Um, if you're doing, as we were just talking in the last question, if you're doing a PA feed and doing your broadcast mix as a secondary mix, then do it on a mix bus so that your program feed and uh, broadcast feed can be independently adjusted and uh, not dependent on each other. But yeah, if all you're doing as uh, I think as Lucas just mentioned, if you had a second console at an event or if all it is is a broadcast, yeah, sure. Just do it on the, do it on the main mix. Less that's less stages, uh, gain stages and less uh, routing. You have to worry about and just roll with it. And then comms, obviously you never want to, accidentally put comms into any broadcast mix. And next question comes from Paul Wallace in Austin, Texas. Oh, this is a simple little one. What's the best live audio setup for a live podcast with a host and a guest? Budget, middle of the road, and high-end configurations. So we could spend about three and a half weeks on this, and uh, nobody particularly is brave enough to have said they want to go out and try to do the best possible system. Oh, Ed's going to be our brave <laughs> trailblazer here. Take it away, Ed. Uh, I'm going to just say uh, it It depends. And uh, <laughs> I think that's basically, hasn't that been the last uh, three years of office hours discussion of finding what is the best and testing things. So just test things that work for you. This is an SM7B. I happen to like how this sounds. Uh, I know that uh, office hours, you know, many different types of microphones have become uh, in and out of favor of popularity uh, from the piles to the heels to everything else. So uh, just test what you can and uh, it's whatever is best for you, whatever sounds best to you. Yeah, it's it's a moving target, and he's exactly right. Through the course of the three years we've been doing office hours, the mics that have risen and then kind of dropped back a little as, quote, the best at the time at a particular price point has been variable. It's interesting you bring up the piles because in the very early days of the shows, we were trying to get people who didn't have a lot of money, particularly our teachers and other people, to find something that was adequate, very inexpensive, and kind of reliable. So we recommended that for a while because it was cheap. Got a mic really close to the mouse, so signal-to-noise ratio wasn't a problem. But then they became hard to get, and suddenly we couldn't find them anymore, and we had to move to a different thing and move to a different thing. So it's very much a moving target, Paul, and uh, I hope the big, best answer is probably keep coming back to office hours on Thursday for the audio thing. Bring that question up and watch the moving array of panelists try to help you find the best solution at any one time. The next question comes from Henry, Henry Ramos in Yonkers, New York. Are powered speakers with delay options worth the additional cost? What size room does it become more beneficial in? Andy, start us off. Uh, they're worth the cost, but for a different reason. So uh, delay-wise, I'll use the console, the, the outputs on the console to delay different sets of speakers depending on where they are in the room. Um, I find that way easier than going up to the speaker and adjusting its DS DSP. So there's that. The reason I like these newer speakers is they're, we're into another generation of, like, for example, power speakers on sticks, which I think is probably maybe what you're referring to here. Um, the newer ones like the uh, QSC uh, uh, K.2 or K2 point, whatever they call it, it's their second generation of their K series. They sound great. Um, I own a pair of Yamaha that are the equivalent of that. They all have onboard DSP. That DSP has gotten a lot better. These speakers sound a lot better than the previous generation. That's the reason to go with something like that. Ed? Uh, yeah, Andy nailed it. It's uh, exactly right. They The second generation of them, they, they got better. Um, but also, I'll do the same thing. I, I'll delay in the console whenever possible, which is why the iPad becomes great. I can do my measurements with my disto, and then I can verify standing in the position I want to position to make sure my alignment is right. Um, if you had nothing else, though, if you were, say, on an analog console, you know, if you have that delay, great, you know, sure, use it if, if you need it. You know, if you're in a long room and you have to put a set of speakers further back in the room and, and you have the ability to, to measure out what the delay should be, yeah, it's, it's, it's a, a useful tool and it's going to sound better, you know. Um, for the people, it's not going to sound like an echo. Where it seems to matter uh, would be if you were spacing those speakers out more than like 30 to 50 feet apart. Um, 
because that's when you're going to start getting that acoustical latency from the speakers in the, in the front of the room traveling all the way to the back. That's where you start hearing it as a second source, those, uh, those delay speakers. So that's where you would want to start kind of thinking about it. We're close to the end of time for the show. Uh, I wanted to give Marty a chance to kind of wrap things up. I think he also had a note on that. But uh, uh, Marty, you want to close things off a little bit? Whoops, you're muted. Just one more note about powered speakers with DSPs built into them. Some of them have wireless control options like the JBL Eons and some others. And so I, I can use my phone or my tablet to adjust <clears throat> EQ to uh, they even have feedback eliminators built into them as well as display uh, uh, delays. <clears throat> so that makes them even more powerful and more useful because they can augment what I can do in the console. So I want to um, thank all of the panelists that joined me here today. This was such a pleasure to do and to talk about uh, live audio and how to approach and what things you need to think about and, and the universal truths depend that are, you know, for all kinds of events. And, you know, this is uh, just one in a, in a series of events uh, uh, office hours, second hours on audio that we're going to get into. We're going to be bringing in some engineers and some producers and some artists uh, to talk about, to, to dive further into uh, some of the particulars and the specifics and uh, uh, things you can do with mixes and, and how different engineers approach mixes. So this is going to be really interesting. Stay tuned. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, a couple of housekeeping notes. Alex's brother, Joe Lindsay, is going to be here tomorrow demonstrating the Airy Trinity Hybrid Camera Stabilizer. Should be fun. We've been hearing for a long time that Alex's brother does a lot of work on kind of high, high-end shows. And so for those of you who are interested in steady cam type work, tomorrow should be outstanding. As should Friday, our show Friday, we're going to have the Zoom team back. Andy Carluccio, Jonathan Cocatello, and Sam Kakaiko, all from Zoom, will be here talking about the latest things, uh, liminal apps, and just generally, if you want a little bit of a tap into where Zoom's thinking is, great thing to do. So... Uh, our huge thanks to everybody on the panel. Such expertise we, we were able to attach today, and we really appreciate the time that everybody spends to come here and do that kind of thing. It's, it's, it's gigantically important that we continue to attract this level of expertise, and we all stand in awe of it every time it shows up every day. Um, to our constituencies out there, particularly those of you who ask questions, we appreciate you coming here every day and driving the show content by asking the intelligent questions you ask every day. We couldn't do this without you and our back end crew. They're silent, they're hidden, unless you take the time, and I hope you do, to watch the closing credits. You will see when you do that a huge number of people in the back end of this, all working diligently all around the planet, coming together in real time for this show. It's pretty singular and pretty unusual. I don't think uh, anybody else is doing what we're doing here every day. So huge thanks out to the crews. Uh, let's see, our Tulloch Traversal, we did 54,020 miles today. That's about 86,000, almost 87,000 kilometers. More than 127 million bananas for scale or 2.2 times around the Earth if you are measuring everything linearly. Uh, that is the show. That is Office Hours. Thanks for being here, and we will see you in After Hours and tomorrow right here. That was pretty cool. You guys are great as always. Thank you. Thanks for coming in. Nice to have you back. Great conversation. Great questions. Producers did really well today. We don't hear you, Andy. <laughs> Thanks for back. That's awesome. Awesome. Sounds like people are whispering into gates. <laughs> the gate's closed. Open the gate. Do not gate your whispers. <laughs> cool. Thanks, everyone. <laughs> well done. Thanks, Marty, for arranging everything for us. Yeah, this was fun.